This is Chris Albert, and I'm here to remind you of one thing. Someday, you're going to die. Now, that's not some morbid statement or scary idea. It's a solid fact. Your time here on this earth is limited. And you need to be reminded of this as much as possible for one simple reason. To live your best life while you can. This is the Warrior Soul Podcast. What's going on, everybody? Uh, I hope everybody out there is enjoying the holiday season, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to release a really special episode. This is an interview with my good friend, Craig Grassi, and his dog, Fred the Afghan. Now, Craig is the author of a book called Craig and Fred, and it talks about the story of how Craig met Fred the Afghan. And, and Fred is a little white dog. Um, he's, he's little, but he's long. He kind of looks like a short version of a golden retriever, if, if that makes sense. You got to see a picture of him to, in order to see it. Just really cute. Craig was a U.S. Marine serving in one of the most dangerous areas of Afghanistan. And amidst this combat zone, one day he saw this floppy white little dog. And so he went out and he greeted him and he saw that he was all covered with bugs and ticks and all kinds of different things. So what he did was he took the dog back into the compound, which was actually way against the rules for a U.S. Marines serving abroad. Uh, and him and one of the corpsmen removed all the ticks from Fred's body. And then Fred started hanging around and the whole unit start, started loving him and protecting him and caring for him. And during that time period, uh, they they grew really attached. And you've got to read the book. It's one of my favorite books that I've ever read. Craig and Fred, really, really amazing story. Uh, at any rate, since the book got released, Craig, Fred, and Nora, who, who's Craig's uh, Craig's partner, they they've been traveling around the country and just kind of spreading this this story of positivity. And I love them. I got a chance to go and meet them all in person in Pasadena this past summer. And the story is really affecting a lot of people in a positive way. And I wanted to take this opportunity to spread some positive holiday cheer for all of you uh, during this holiday season. Before we get started, I just want to say that the Warrior Soul podcast could not be possible without our good friends at F-Bomb Nutrition. Uh, really great people who have a really great product. Now, products, they make awesome macadamia nut butters, but they also make amazing cheese crisps. Really, really awesome low-carb snack that you can take with you. All of their products are absolutely delicious, and you can get 20% off of your first order when you go to www.dropandfbomb.com and use the code WARRIORSOUL at checkout. And that's it as far as everything goes, guys. Um, those of you who've been to the podcast before, you know what we do here. We're all about helping the U.S. military veteran community to live their best lives and anybody else who's willing to listen. If you get helped by one of these episodes, please do us a favor and share them out to people who can use them and go over to iTunes and write us a written review. It really helps us spread the word about the show and about this mission. With that, let's get into this conversation with Craig Grassi and Fred the Afghan. What? What is going on, Craig? How you doing, man? Hey, hey, Chris. How are you, man? I'm doing awesome. I see you're there in New York City. You got Fred staring out the window out there, man. We do that all day. This guy, he loves his windows. He loves people watching. It's pretty. It's pretty funny. He loves coming to New York too. After a couple of days, he's like, "All right, like I, I want to be off the leash. So let me take me somewhere. Take me home. <laughs> take, take me back to me. I want to chase squirrels and stuff." But he, it's it's pretty cool. He definitely gets a, a an extra kind of little like kind of uh, chip in his step or chip on his shoulder when we walk around here because he just loves looking at everyone and smell. There's you can't go two feet without smelling something, even if it's pretty gross. <laughs> yeah, there's probably a lot of gross stuff on the street out yeah. there. Um, yeah. 
for those of you who who might not have listened to the first episode we did with Craig and Fred, uh, you should listen to that. This is Craig and Fred are two of the few guests we've had on for a second time. And it's because we absolutely love their story and because it's the holiday season right now. And we really want to spread some cheer. And if there's one thing that both these guys are good at, it's spreading some cheer. But for those who uh, are going to go back to listen to that first episode, can you tell us a little bit about your story, like the, the helicopter version of it? Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I, I found Fred in uh, it was, uh, late summer 2010 in, uh, in Helmand in, in an area called Sangin. Uh, I was an in Afghanistan, guy. right? In Afghanistan. Uh, I was a, an Intel guy. I was a head guy attached to First Recon, uh, Charlie Company, and we, we ripped in and uh, inserted out of, out of 53s, out of, the, out of the helicopters, and just kind of occupied a, a little house. And that first week, we were really, you know, we really kind of just stood our ground and held our position as best we could because the Taliban threw everything they had at us. Uh, in the middle of all that, we spotted this dog, you know, and he was just so different from everything around him. We all instantly kind of fell in love with him. And over the course of about 30 days there, we all, you know, just started to, you know, realize that he was special and he was different. And then he kind of, you know, embodied a lot of what we felt like we were over there for, you know, just the fact that he could be a dog and he could be who he was you know, and, and that that was unique was was kind of you know, unfortunately, kind of a, a, a problem. You know, we wanted, but we wanted to protect it. We wanted to kind of you know make sure that he got the life that he deserved. And uh, I left it up. It was a big risk, you know. So I left it up to him. And he, and I said, if you follow me to the helicopter, you're not scared off by the noise and the dust and all the craziness that is a, a combat extract. You know, and you come, you know, come with us. Uh, you know, I'll see what I can do. You know, I'll try to get you the rest of the way home. And, Sure enough, we started running towards the bird, and, and he's right at my heel. And I had a, uh, a kit bag, a duffel bag in my pocket, and I pulled it out. And we, me and my me and uh, master, master sergeant, me and Top Schmidt, stuffed him in there and ran him up the back of the bird. And, and the rest of his journey home, I always say, you know, is is a great story, but it, it's a really uh, important story because it really shows how people can come together from different parts of the world, different cultures, different backgrounds. Around a, a common good, around a really good, you know, representation of, of something. And in this case, it's a dog, you know. And and because Fred, Fred getting home was no accident, you know, it could have gone wrong a hundred different ways at any time. And uh, the fact that we were able to pull it off, I think, is just you know, it's proof to me that we're supposed to be here. We're supposed to share this story and do it in as many ways and places as we can. So that's. That's what we, we love to do. We love doing it with our book and we love doing it uh, and speaking events and on, on awesome shows like, like yours, Chris. Yeah, the the book, Craig and Fred, uh, you know, it, I read it last year. It was one of the best books I read last year. And and I'm not I'm not blowing smoke here. The story, literally, there are parts of the story that, that brought tears to my eyes. I almost cheered at certain parts of the story, like yelled out loud. And And my girlfriend, she felt the same way when she read the book. And so... That is definitely a book that I recommend everybody read. Um, but I got the chance to go out to see Craig and Fred over in Pasadena this past summer. And there was a crowd there, man. You guys draw an absolute crowd. What's that been like for you? It's been, I, I have to, I can't look around, especially in Pasadena. And before that, we were in Colorado outside of Denver. And uh, that the room in Pasadena, like we stay outside because Fred Fred likes to walk in to a room full of people. It's 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 like I've know it's funny. I just noticed the difference when we're sitting there in the room, kind of, and people start coming in versus when we hang hang around outside and then walk in. It's like he because he walks in a room and he's just like, oh, everyone's here for me. And he gets this whole <laughs> this whole stage presence that's really funny. But I, it, it, honestly, man, it's overwhelming. I I, I uh, you know to to go all the way across the country to a community of Pasadena, which is beautiful, but I've never been there. I don't know anybody there, you know, and, and to see us fill a big room in a public library like that. Um, it, I, you know, I couldn't think about it too much then, but it, I've, I've been thinking about it a lot ever since. And, and it's just, to me, it's just, you know, more proof that we're on the right track, you know, and, and it's, you know, we're, we're doing what we're supposed to do with this story. And, and what I love about that is that people are, 
people are, are taking away something from our story that they need that, that I, that I didn't necessarily anticipate, you know, like I, I thought people would just like to read a, a good story about a, a cool dog, you know, and, and about Afghanistan and learn a little bit about our veterans and our, and our military. But people are coming up to me and telling me, this is a book about mental health. This is a book about overcoming adversity. This is a book about love, you know, like all these things. I'm like, I didn't, like, I didn't sit down and write an outline, like, let's write a book about love or you know, mental, mental health. Like, I, that wasn't my, my goal. So I, I think, you know, it's, an, it's another thing for, for us veterans to see the, the success that we've had with our story. And, and, and I hope that the rest of us can see the power of just, of just sharing your story and, and the, the significance of just sharing your story. You don't have to write a book or anything, but just share it with your family and friends and, and as, as much or as little as you want, but it's powerful. It's powerful and, and, and it'll do a lot for you and it'll do a lot for the people that, that hear it. You never know. Yeah. You know, just, just knowing a little bit about the story and, and a little bit about history. I mean, throughout history, warriors have come back and they've been able to tell their story. It, it told yeah. it around a campfire. They told it, you know, at, at different gatherings, they were able to kind of get that stuff out after, after their experience. And yeah knowing a little bit about you and you know, you came back, went to school, went to Georgetown. We're going through, through that. I also know you suffered a TBI um, during your service. And, and, you know, I think Fred got home before you did and you actually suffered a TBI after he'd gotten sent back. Right. Well, yeah, it was actually the, I brought him back to Leatherneck and then we had to go, we had to rip right back to saying it. So I left him with some guys that worked for DHL, went back to, to Sangin and was there for like a week or so. And then I got hit um, with the rocket and they had to, had to bring me out. So that actually ended up, once I got out of the TBI clinic and my head stopped ringing, I was able to get Fred and, and get him the rest of the way home. Um, so that ended up being, in, being a, a blessing catching that rocket. Yeah. And, and, you know, a lot of veterans who suffer, suffer from a TBI, they're, they're going through hell. I mean, there, there, there's a lot of symptoms from the TBI that lead to depression, that lead to exacerbation of, of post-traumatic stress and, and kind of seeing you work through that and work through that alongside Fred. I think that's absolutely amazing. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. It, it, it's been a, it's been a journey, like, you know, with a lot of ups and downs, just like all of them, but um, and it still is, but the, I think the thing that I've realized through it all up to this point is, is that, you know, ultimately it, it gets, gets thrown around a lot, but it, it's okay to not be okay. Mm -hmm. And, and like, that's, you could say that to someone all day long, but you, like, you really need to think about that. And, and as, as Marines and as veterans, as, as, as military folks, like that's, that's a, that's a hard thing for us to, to really grasp because um, we don't like showing our weaknesses. We don't like feeling vulnerable. Um, but that's, that's a, that's a part of, of being a person. And right. we, had, we had to shed that when we joined, we kind of had to minimize that. Um, but it's, it's totally normal. And when you get out, that, that's, that should be kind of a part of, of your mental kind of preparation, you know, is to, to kind of just begin to open yourself up a little bit more, you know, regardless of your experience or your, your injuries or whatever, like just, just think about, you know, your day-to-day -day interactions with people and, you know, you, you don't need to be as on guard. You don't need to be as protective of, of your weaknesses. You can open up, you know, and, and that's one of the biggest ways that, that Fred has kind of shown me that is because walking him around DC when I would, when I first got out, I worked for the government and I was trying to do, to do the government thing. Um, and I hated it and it was killing me. And that's probably when some of my symptoms were at their worst when I was really frustrated, um, you know, just with the bureaucracy and the emails and all that crap. And, and when I'd come home from work and Fred and I would hit the streets, we'd go for a long run or a long walk to a dog park or something. And at first people would ask, you know, they're always asking me what kind of dog, what kind of dog is that? What kind of dog is that? Cause he's so handsome. <laughs> and uh, at first I'd be like, oh, you know, he's just a mutt. He's a, 
you know, I'd make up a breed. He's a, he's a pocket wolf or, a, you know, an Afghan foxhound or, you know, whatever. And people would come, like, oh, yeah, I've heard of those, you know. And, but little by little, I started to, like, be like, you know what? This is a cool story. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell this random person at the dog park about Fred and where they came from, you know. And, I, and the more I started to open up to, in most part, total strangers at the dog park or around at bars or wherever we were, the more I realized that it, I, I enjoyed telling the story and that it also kind of it, it justified a lot of the, the really seemingly um, almost kind of pointless things about the war um, that, you know, you really I, a lot of us have a hard time when we come home with the fact that, you know, what was all that for? You know, like what was the point of all that? You know, and that's that's a that's a, a tough thing to deal with, especially when you've lost friends. And I think if you're standing on U.S. soil and you have the ability to, to share the story of, of your experience, then that's, that's all you need. That's what it was for. You went through it so you could tell – and you survived it so you could tell the tale. And it, it, that's, it doesn't need to be any bigger than that. You know, and, and, and that's, that's what Fred has, has, has shown me through our story, you know, just that, that, that little bit of sharing – can go a, a long way. Um, and it makes, it made my experiences, my TBI, my, you know, um, all the, all the stuff that we went through when I lost my friend, Justin, and, and when, I, when we lost Sean, you know, it, it made it more real. I think we, I was good about kind of putting it in the back seat. Like, ah, the more time goes by, the better I'll feel, you know, like, and, and it, that just wasn't the case. It, does, it doesn't work that way. It's not, it's not like a, you know, it's not like a, a bad date, you know, that you just forget about eventually, you know, it's, it's mm-hmm. like, it's more, it sticks to your head a lot more than that. And the more time you push it down, the more it's going to come back and the more it comes back, the, the uglier it's going to get. So it's, I think, you know, I, I w- I'll never claim to be an authority on, on, on dealing with, with trauma or anything like that, but this is what's worked for me. And to be able to go to, to Pasadena and to be able to go all over the country and, 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 and fill rooms and, and hear from people, from veterans from different eras too, from the Vietnam era. A lot of Vietnam veterans are coming up to me at, at these events too. And like, man, like, thank you. You know, like, thank you for, for your honesty and thank you for your story. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like I, you, like you're in the jungles, you know, like this is, I don't want to hear that from you. Like you're, you're a stud, you know, like this is insane. I, I could have never anticipated that those guys would, would, would um, take away anything from our story. Yeah, that's that's got to be so deep to to hear from guys like that. I are you guys are getting a lot of letters, right? Like from all over the place. There's um and one of the biggest most recent things was uh, this town in Wisconsin uh, called Hillsboro. It's a, a little dairy town uh, in Wisconsin, really beautiful part of the state. And um, we booked a, a speaking event there at at, at uh, two two schools and a VA hospital. And we got on the phone with the, with the lady, Jackie, who was organizing it. And she said, I want you to know, like the whole town has read your book. Like this has been our community read for the last year. And I was like, okay, like, that's nice. You know, maybe her book club read the book and a couple of their families, you know, but I get there and, and our poster is plastered all over the little town, you know, the book cover, you know, and like, and there's like, they had like a countdown to when we were coming and we get there, they had a lot, they had a lot, they had this beautiful brewery right downtown they make their they make their own food there and like their own beer. They had a big lunch and they and come to find out in the uh, days prior to our arrival, uh, they had had all their community's veterans from regardless of the era uh, coming to their schools, to their elementary schools and their high schools, and they, they were spending like, eating lunch with the kids and hanging out with the kids in the days leading up to our visit and engaging you know, and like asking, having the kids ask them questions about their service. And so we get there and, and it's like, all this is had already taken place. And they had a, um, a big, after my first school, we went to, to lunch at this brewery and they had a big, you know, lunch for all the, all the town's veterans. And I, I was like blown away that our story, this little, this little dog, you know, had become like the catalyst for all of this engagement because people were coming up to me. Like I'd never told even my, my wife, some of the stuff that I told these kids at the school, 
you know, and like, and, and Jackie, the, the organizer was like, I, I grew up, that's my, that's my mailman. Like that's my neighbor. I, I known them my whole life. I didn't even know they were in Vietnam. Wow. You know, and, and uh, you know, now he, I walk into school, you know, one of the classrooms and he's talking to the kids about, you know, patrolling through the jungle, you know, and all that, and what the, you know, what that was like. And like, that's, that's insane. That's insane. And, and, and that, that particular visit was uh, an example of, uh, of a really exceptional town and especially and it's an exceptional person. This lady, Jackie is un- unreal. She did so much work. Um, and, and it all started actually with her brother, Tony, who's a, a two nine guy, um, uh, a, a grunt from two nine who was in saying in, in, in Marja around the same time as, as me, but he read the book and passed it off to his sister. Um, and so it, that's, that's one of the best examples, um, you know, besides going, going all the way to the West coast and, and to Pasadena and seeing a room full of people and then going to this little town, you know, that really, you know, it, it's, it's a community kind of thing. And I think that's what was missing for a long time. Um, especially during the Vietnam era was when those guys came home, like they, you know, they, they didn't want to tell anybody about what they, because they didn't want to get spit on. They didn't know how people would react. You know, and I, I think the fact that our book can can bring a little bit of peace of mind, a little bit of peace to some of those guys and their experiences, like that's that's very humbling. That's absolutely amazing. You know, you you mentioned that idea of of, of a small town and, and, and an exceptional town. You know, one of the things I think because you and I come from similar ge- geographic areas, we're from the East Coast. Um, we were raised around kind of urban urbanish areas. And I think that when East, when East Coast people get to travel around the rest of the country and yeah. see what, the way people do things and in other places, it's it, it, like and not to say anything bad about the East Coast because I I love where I come from, but it's right. just this the sense of community is so different yeah. when you go across the country and you get to travel and you get to speak to people and you see the things that are so important to them and, and that bond them together, you know. Absolutely. I, and, and it's, it's like, I love coming to New York cause it's like, I feel like a total outsider in the, in the best way. I feel like I'm watching a show. Like when you walk around here, it's, it's nuts. It's like people, people, it's, it's a really interesting way to live. And I, I didn't used to see it that way. Uh, cause I, I lived in DC for a long time, you know, and, and, and it was kind of a similar kind of vibe where people have like a little bubble around them and it's not like, no one's really concerned about, each other's welfare and um and that's what i love about just a side note like that's what i love about walking around new york with fred because fred breaks that bubble down immediately like i was just telling you before the show we walk i walked him across the street and there's this traffic cop like yelling at people and like smacking cabs on the roof you know trying to get him through this intersection and fred comes prancing through the through the intersection and just is like looking at her you know with his big eyes and she's just like melts instantly he's like hey sweetie good morning you know like talking to him and he's like talking back and it's so so funny about how quickly those walls can come down but when you go to a town like hillsborough or when you go to a you know a different community that's not you know just so overpopulated like so many of our of our cities on the east coast you get this really you know good sense of of community and what I like about it and what I love about where we live in Maine and just Maine as a, as a state is accountability. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, the people in Maine, if they say they're, they're going to do, and it's not just Maine, but that's what was really drawn us there. But people in these communities like that, if they say they're going to do something, if they say they're going to, you know, meet you for coffee or shoot you an email or, you know, or or anything like that, that you you better believe that's going to happen. You know, and, and I think, especially in DC. I lived there for a long time. And the thing that, that kind of drove me away the, the most was the insincereness. The, the, in, like just people would tell you whatever they thought you wanted to hear. And yeah. veterans, veterans get a lot of lip service there. You know, you, you go to like a, a job function or, you know, a, you know, a different, you know, all the contractors have booths, you know, and you, you go and talk to, you know, different people who say they're hiring and, and you get, a thousand business cards and, and maybe one follow up, you know, right. and you know, I got you devil dog. Okay. Okay. You're an Intel guy. You know, I'll, I'll take care of you. I'll get you, you know, this and that. And it's just, 
it doesn't go anywhere. At least right. that was that was my experience. And the, the, the first time going up to Maine and and ha- doing a, doing a show in Maine and and somebody saying, "Oh, I'm you know I'm going to shoot you an email because we have a hockey club that meets every week," you know, and like within an hour, that's what happened. You know, it was just really really cool to see. Yeah, that's one one other thing I noticed about DC too when I was there because I, I I did some internships and some jobs down there for a while. Every time you go out and you start a conversation, it's what do you do? Who do you work for? What what can you do for me? And and that yeah. that just can't, again DC people. I'm not I'm not talking crap about you. I'm just saying that that sometimes for outsiders going there, it seems like you are overly concerned with what occupation the person you're talking to does. Yeah. It, it's it's frustrating, and, and I I found the only, I think the only reason I was able to live there as long as I did is I found the one street, the one neighborhood that kind of wasn't like that. It's mm-hmm. becoming more, more like that now. But it's this area. Where the, I read about it in my book, I, the Pug, um, mm-hmm. where my favorite bar is called the Pug. If you walk in there talking about you know what's what what, what senator you work for, what agency you work for, like they're going to laugh you out of the place. No one, no one <laughs> That's that's around Georgetown, right? No, that that's for other side of town. Um, okay, the north northeast side of town um it was a bad neighborhood for a long time unfortunately but it's it's coming around um and georgetown has some decent pockets too but it's it, i think the thing with dc and a lot of big cities is people kind of move there for a purpose right they move it for work they don't move there you know like you don't move to new york because the the, the, the real estate is still great you know right. like you're gonna get this sweet huge apartment like it's you move there because you want to pay your dues you want to work a job so people even when they're off even when they're you know interacting socially that's they can't flip that switch and and you know and, and turn their turn their work brains off and i think that's really important you know and and that's what a lot of the, a lot of the different towns and you know in different parts of the of the country that are more rural you know that's what they have going for them because you you, you don't want to walk in a in a restaurant and meet a friend for for work and just talk about work all day, you know, like you want to talk about, you know, what you guys are going to do that weekend or, you know, how their family is, you know, and, and it's just a lot more to talk about. That's awesome. Now you, uh, are you working on another book right now? Or are you thinking about getting one out there? Yeah, actually, um, that's one of the, we, we came to New York for, um, for, a, a, a gala actually where, where the hotel we're staying in is right next to a big, the, the animal medical center. It's this big hospital. Mm-hmm. It's been around for like 120 years. It's an amazing organization in New York, um, and they honored Fred as their top dog for the year at this big gala. It was pretty, pretty amazing. Um, but while we're here, we decided to meet with um, meet with my with uh, my agent and and uh, the, this uh, lady named Kelly, who I collaborate with, and we kind of you know flush ideas out with, and she helped me a lot with Craig and Fred. And um, the yeah, the next book is 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 kind of the priority right now. I want to want to get going on, on that. And um I'm excited about it because it's it a lot has a lot to do with the the meaningful connections that you make when you live in a community. Um and, and it's it's just happened up to, happened to be me um for me and and I've been going up and spending time uh in the main state prison mm-hmm. um which is Shawshank, which is yeah. that's what it is Shawshank it's stood as Shawshank for like uh, like from 1880 something to 2000 it was one of the oldest operating prisons until 2000 um now it's a modern facility and the the warden um is an incredible guy he's an army veteran battle of fallujah um and he took over i think a year or two ago as the warden and he realized that there are a lot of veterans in in the prison and so he created he's created a lot of really awesome programs, but one of them is this, he created a cell block, a whole pod, they call them pods, uh, but he created a pod that's just for veterans, just for people who served. And if they're on good enough behavior, they can get into this, this pod. And when you walk in there, I, I worked in prisons my first four years. I worked in the brig my first four years in down in Guantanamo Bay and, and in Charleston, South Carolina. And when you walk in this, this pod for veterans, it's like, it's almost like a, I don't know. It just feels more like a community center. It kind of has like a this whole different vibe that you wouldn't expect in a in a in a, in a, a state penitentiary. And there's murals on the wall of all the different branches, and there's plants, and there's dogs. There's dogs running around because that that's one of the other things that they do is is uh, about uh, right now I think they have about four dogs from America's Vet Dogs, and they trade they have them for the first eighteen months of their lives, 
and they're training them to be service dogs. And then they hand them off and they get their specialty training for whatever disability they're going to be for. And um, I've been going up there and just first it was just because they read the book and they wanted, wanted me to come and say hi and bring Fred. But there's something there, you know, there's, the, there's, 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 their stories are, are really interesting and sad um, in a lot of ways, but I want to, I want to share more about what these guys are doing, you know, cause they don't have to, they don't have to, to do that. You know, they don't have to try and get in this veterans pod. They don't have to, it, it, they don't get really get anything out of working with these dogs other than they get to work with the dog, but it's a lot of work. It's not like they just play with a puppy all day. Like they have to train them and it's, you know, it takes a lot of patience and, and discipline to do that. Um, you know, and I think it's, it's the connection to, to serving again, you know, that they, that they had when they were in the military, you know, and, and they, they, despite, you know, the, the things that led them into prison, they, they want to give back in, in, in some way, you know, and, and um, so that, that's, that's kind of what I'm excited about, about working on this, exploring those stories. Well, I think the thing is, you know, a lot of us think that if we had tons of free time, we'd be okay, right? right. That if we, if we, we, we had a lot of different types of free time, we'd, we'd be able to do what we wanted and everything like that. The problem is that our brains don't really work like that. You know, we're yeah. meant to be part of a community. We're meant to serve. We're meant to to contribute to a group. And if we're not doing that, the, the best analogy I've ever heard is actually a dog analogy. And that's with a, an Australian shepherd, right? Australian yeah. shepherds are amazing dogs. They're beautiful. They, they're extremely smart. But if you don't give them anything to do, if you don't satisfy that natural herding instinct, the right. dog goes crazy and it starts ripping up the house and it starts digging holes. And yeah. that's what humans do too. If we don't have our minds occupied with something, if we're not working on something, yeah. then, then we start digging holes and we can dig ourselves into a hole. Right. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great analogy. You're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I mean, how many people say it all the time? Like, Oh, if I didn't have this job, if I didn't work so much, I, I could get everything done. If I could just have, and then when you get time off, you just like you just crash, you know, because you don't, you don't, you can't function without that, that kind of structure. Yeah, that's that's really I like that analogy a lot. I'm gonna keep that in mind. Yeah, and, and, and for these for these guys, it, it's it's cool to to walk in there and really quickly like you sit down with you know five or six of them and you start hearing stories about their deployments, stories about boot camp, you know, all the, 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 the classic kind of veteran talk, you know, and in a couple of minutes, you kind of forget that you're in a, in a prison, you know, and it's, it, to me, it's a, it's a good illustration of, of the strength of, of, of service, you know, the bond that we all share, you know, because we put that uniform on, we signed on that line, you know, like we always, we'll always have that commonality regardless of, of our circumstances, you know, and, Another thing it really makes me think about is all the all the times that I could have ended up in, down that road, you know, and just one you know one bad day really could could lead you down that slippery slope, you know, or or just makes me if nothing else it makes me really grateful that I I came home to a, a community that was pretty intact in terms of like you know I, I came back to Fairfax, Virginia, which is you know, a very safe, very, you know, easy place to kind of live. And, and my, my dad still had the house so I could kind of be with him and, and figure out my next move. And, but a lot of these guys got, you know, they served and then they came home back to their town and the town was overrun with drugs and crime and there are no jobs. And, you know, it's, it's, I'm not making excuses for anybody, but when you think about taking a, somebody who served and was in for, you know, four years or more and got used to that environment. And then they come home and they, and they can't find a job and they have all this energy and all this potential. What, to, where are they going to go? Are they going to, are they going to, what kind of hole are they going to dig for themselves? You know, and it's, you know, it's, it's really kind of heartbreaking to, to, to see that. And then, but in terms of personal accountability, I have to really think about myself and that man, like that, that could have very easily been any one of us and it definitely could have easily been me in terms of just not dealing with with things the right way and the mistakes that I made if I hadn't had a a good you know community around me a good cushion you know I, it could have it could have gone could have gone wrong 
Yeah, I think a lot of guys, they, they end up, you know, their friends are sit, saving them a seat at the bar, right? The, the same bar stool they would have been on it had they never joined. And, you know, I found myself in that situation, you know, when I got back, uh, I was I, I was basically just drinking my life away and partying my life away. And and for other people, like, it might not be like that. It might be, you know, they're, they're, they're getting into other bad stuff, but um, I think it's important you find something, something to keep you going, something to keep that that fire alive, something to keep that mind going. Because right. otherwise, it's it's, it's just going to go to crap and it sucks. Yeah. yeah, it does. It's it it's yeah. So that's you know I'm hoping to to shed some light and you know gain some perspective for for everybody you know about the the opportunities that we have. You know, and if you served. Um, I think, I, I think one of the things that I, I struggled with was my confidence mm-hmm. and because I didn't, one of the things that I didn't have was I didn't have a lot of veterans around me. I moved back when I moved back to DC, I, I was surrounded by my friends that I know my whole life and they're, they're fantastic. They're like some of the, my, they're my, my family in a lot of ways, but, but most of them hadn't served in the military especially in, back then. None of them had served. And so it was like kind of easy for me to, to kind of forget, you know, what I was capable of. And I think if, if you forget that, if you forget, you know, just even if you just went through Paris Island or went through boot camp, but you did some, you did some crazy stuff. Like you were up all night and you were, you know, like you, you pushed yourself and you accomplished a lot in a short amount of time. And if we can remind ourselves, you know, of those times or those harder times when we, did great things, then we can find that, that energy and that confidence in the civilian world. And we can bring that into the civilian world and, 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 and into our professional and, and personal lives, you know, and it's just, it just takes a little bit to kind of remind ourselves of that. And if, if nothing else is just talking to another, another veteran or just, or even I'm, I'm reading a, a book, a Nate Fix book right now, One Bullet Away, which is a, a fantastic book. Um, about, you know, he was a, a first recon, um, officer and led the charge into, into Iraq in, in 03. And, um, but it's like giving me a whole new, like burst of energy, you know, just reading about, you know, his, his experiences through training and, and, you know, becoming an officer and, and all that. I'm like, man, like, okay. Yeah. Like we, I did some of that stuff. Like I can, you know, so how hard is it for me to get up a little earlier and, and go for a run, you know, or how hard, like what's stopping me from you know, from writing another book or from exploring, you know, other, other options, you know, or, or other avenues, like what, what's my excuse, you know, like back in the day, I, you know, I would, I have done six miles before, before breakfast, you know, like this is, you know, I can get up and, and answer some emails, you know, like it's, it's just a, a, a reminder, you know, of what we're capable of. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, it's, it, it, and that's something I got, I have to do. I have to constantly try to do that. I have to constantly try to to push myself physically. I have to constantly try to find something that's going to push myself mentally, um, whether it's a new project, whether it's, but I, and that just back to that analogy again, if it's not focused, if that energy isn't focused, you end up running all over the place, trying to figure it out. And And I think what's cool about you is that you found something to really focus on here, you know, and, and, I, uh, yeah, I was asking myself this question before we got on, you know, what would lead somebody to write a book, right? What would lead, because a book is, is it's a it's torturous process, right? Like you, you've got to sit down, you got to sort through your thoughts. You got to type it all out when it comes out. It's probably a, a first draft might be a mess. You got to go back and that could take a long time. What, what was really driving you at that point? When, when did you say, all right, I am going to do this. This is going to, to get out there and print and I'm going to, I'm not going to stop until it's out there. Yeah. It's, um, that's a great question. And it, it is like a kind of a exhausting process. But I, I guess it's one of those things that I think about it sometimes like, like running. Like I, I, I love to run. And like I went for a run yesterday and I was like, I'll do a quick three and I'll come back. And I ended up doing six because I went running down this, down the river here in, in New York. It was like, Oh, I, okay. What's that? I got to see that, you know? And, and like, 
there's a bridge I, that people, I saw people walking over this little pedestrian bridges to an island. I was like, oh, that's cool. I got to check that out. You know, and it's like, the, so the more I ran, the more I saw and the more I realized I, I wanted to see. And when you start to write, especially about your own experiences, the more it's a painstaking process, but it's, it's a detailed process. And it, you lose a lot of the details in your own head when you just try to through your own memories but without you know without writing them down but when you write them down you you remember how cold it was that day you know what you did the day before something happened who was there um you know who wasn't there you know you remember all these details and the the therapy of it i guess is in that too because you you see the purpose you see where things went right and where things went wrong. And, and that's, you know, a lot of times, especially when something good happens, we're really good about just being like, Oh, congrats. You know, like, that's great. You know, and we move on. Um, but if you want to really, you know, do a good thing, justice or an accomplishment, gut justice, you need to kind of reverse engineer it, you know, and kind of explore, you know, how you got there, you know, because if when something bad happens, we're very good about that. We're very good about, you know, who's, who, you know, didn't do their job, who went wrong, who's to blame, you know, and we, we demand kind of this accountability. Um, but I think we're, we're, we're not, you know, we're not uh, doing everything justice if we, if we don't explore the same, with the same kind of commitment, you know, the good things. And I think with writing, that's, you know, that's, that's what it is. That's, it's, it's kind of, expanding our experiences and, and seeing the significance in them. Um, and, and it just, you just chip away at it. It's, you know, it, 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 uh, the more you, the more I write, the more I see, you know, that, that it's, it's, it's bigger than me. Um, and the, the success of, of Craig and Fred of our, of, of my first book, um, you know, it, it is, it's, it's because of other people. It's because of people who have read it and have taken away something and have made it, they've made it bigger than, than I could have ever imagined, you know? And so I just want to continue to, to put stuff out there that, that people can, can do that with, that people can kind of grab onto and, you know, and, and, and use for themselves. I, 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 that really motivates me. Right. And, and, and that's the thing. I think, you know, a lot of people think that when they're writing a book, it's about them, right. Or when they're doing something, it's about them. I think one of the reasons why you're the perfect steward of this story, I think that that that's maybe the proper term, this, this steward yeah. of this whole story um, is that you're actually a really humble guy and that you see how big this is comp- in, in the big picture, as far yeah. as how the story can help other people. Right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I, the hardest thing, you're more humble than me. No, <laughs> no, 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 man. <laughs> we could do that all day, man. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's, I, lo- I love, I, I love my friends and I love the people I serve with. And I, I just, I, like, I, like, I'm so grateful to look around a room and, and see people that have come into my life. And I, I want, I want to, I want to share them. I want to share, you know, their influence on, on me, you know? So yeah, it, it, it was, it is always hard for me to write about, about myself because I don't want anyone to ever think for a second that I'm, I'm like, you know, beating my chest or that I, I, I uh, am very, you know, proud of, of myself. You know, I, I, I am in some ways, but it's not, I don't know. It's, it's tricky. I, I you know, I'm not, you know, I don't see myself as, as this great Marine, you know, I, I serve with some really great Marines mm-hmm. and if anything, I, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just doing, like you said, I'm, I'm a steward, you know, and I, and I am just doing my duty by sharing, by sharing these stories. And, um, it, it's, I think I can't, I was like, I got to look it up. I got to look up the speech, but it was by a, it was by a civil war veteran. Um, and I was thrown around at a, a, a writing clinic I went to in the early days of my, my writing, um, by the veterans writing project, which is a great nonprofit uh, that do, does writing clinics for vets. Um, but essentially the guy was like, just like, he was shot to bits. He like, 
missing a bunch bunch of you know digits and stuff and he was like you know the, the essential message of his of his speech was it's our duty you know all of us that he was talking to a bunch of other civil war veterans and he was like it's our duty now to to tell the tale like if you're still here if your heart is still beating in your chest then you know tell the stories of those who aren't you know and keep them alive through through your life and I, that's you know that was a big motivator for me um, with Craig and Fred and with, you know, continuing to write. And the only way that I was really able to write about myself was I actually, in my head, I, I, I wrote um, what I might've looked like or what I thought I looked like to my friends, to Justin specifically, my friend who was killed. Um, I, you know, just about like, you know, that I kind of saw myself through his eyes, you know, and that was, that made it a little easier for me to write about, about what I did and, 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 and my part in all of it. Um, you know, cause it, it's, it's also, I think it just has a lot to do with, with being a Marine and, 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 you know, being told constantly that, you know, your, your mom was wrong. You're not special, you know, <laughs> and, right. you know, and, and, you know, we're, we're not supposed to, to really, uh, dwell on any of you know those achievements that you know that we make we're supposed to you know look look to the Iwo Jima statue and be like those are the those are the guys you're chasing you know or Chesty Puller or you know there's always going to be somebody that was that was you know bigger and better and harder than us and it just, it, I think that's great I think that's that's something that that kind of carries over into the into the civilian world but uh I, and I was thinking about this analogy th- about that helps um kind of break down how I felt when I got out. It's like when you, if you're a sports person, like if you play, anytime you play, like on, like for, I'm a hockey player. And anytime my team, we're a really you know, good team. Everybody does their, does their job well. We're, we're sharp and ready to rock like an A-level team. When you go out and you play a B-level team, sometimes what happens is you end up playing down to that level. You end up, playing slower and, and moving the puck slower and not talking. And you end up kind of getting sucked into this crappier version of what you were supposed to be. And I think that can happen. That can happen to, to veterans. I think that can happen to us when we get out and we're not surrounded all of a sudden, we're not surrounded by people on our left and right who are demanding the best of us every day. We're kind of, you know, we're surrounded by people who you kind of just get by, you know, and they're okay with that. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not us. Right. You know, that's not, that's not what we should be about. We should be about achieving, you know, the the, uh, the maximum amount of potential. If that's you know, that's if that's what you believe in. And I, I think that 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 definitely happened to me. I definitely kind of at one point was just looking. Ah, I just want to get a job that you know, yeah, I, you know, I get a pay bump every year and I can get by. You know, and like that's I kind of fell into that for a second. Um, but I was really unhappy. And and I think deep down I, I I was like, what are you doing? Like this isn't you. You want more. You want more. Like you need to be striving for more. You're here for a reason. You need to find it. You know. And I think there's nothing against the anybody that 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 is just you know wants a, a good steady job. Like that's not, I hope nobody thinks that that's what I'm you know saying. You shouldn't you know settle you know for that. But you should always find something that makes you a little uncomfortable, even if it's just in your personal life, like, you know, writing or, or, or exploring art or exploring a, a new story or a new book or making a, making a new connection with somebody like it, it, it there's just something that's in us that, that won't be satisfied unless we're pushing ourselves in some way, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Right. Right. I think that's uh that's so important. And no matter what you're doing it in, you know, this is the other thing. It could happen even if you have like a full time career. There, there could be something that you're doing with your life that's pushing you a little bit more, right? There could be right. something that you're doing with your life that that is going to make you think outside of the box, and that's going to to push your comfort zone a little bit. Because we have we have comfort zones all around us. We have comfort zones yeah. of what we're doing in our professional lives. But we have comfort zones in our personal lives. How much we're going to trust somebody. Are we yeah. going to let somebody in? Are we going to work on our relationship, right? Because there's a lot of trust involved in, in having a relationship. There's a lot of trust involved in, in letting somebody into your personal life and, and um, you know, not, not, you know, in treating them well and, and all of these different things. So 
uh, we get, I think we all got to figure out how we're going to push our own boundaries as to, you know, becoming better and stronger people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, relationships, that's a, that's a big one. Mm -hmm. And that, that goes back to what we were talking about before about, and it's like, oh, we're kind of contradicting ourselves in some ways because we're like, oh, remember who you were in the Marines or the, the military. Remember, you know, all the things that made you achieve and, and, and strive. And, but also, like, chill a little bit and, right. and, and relax and, and let people in. And, and, and so I guess it is this, it is a, there is a balance and there is this, what do you keep and, and what do you kind of let go of, you know, in term, and, and I think with relationships, it's a different approach. You don't need to treat everybody like, you know, like they're plotting against you or that, or like they're one of your troops, you know, or that, you know, they're one of your, of your coworkers. Like you, 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 you can let people in, you can share, you know, your feelings, you can share your, your fears and, 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 you know, your vulnerabilities and, and that will make you stronger and that will make your relationships stronger. Um, you know, and I think, yeah, that's, that's the part that needs to come down a little bit, but if anything, the, the accountability and the, and the energy and the, the idea of, of challenging yourself and being uncomfortable almost needs to kind of get, get dialed up a little bit because it's really easy to, to, to play down to that B team and just right. kind of, I'll just get by. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You guys, uh, you, so where, where are you guys headed next after New York? Are you going back up to Maine for the holidays or are you going down? we will finally, we haven't had more than two weeks off the road, uh, pretty much all year, like 20, right, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to calculate the mileage. I know, um, just in, just this summer we did over 30,000 miles, um, and I only know that because we got a new truck and, and I could see the odometer. But um, so we're, we're going to head home tomorrow, um, Friday, and, and, and just, yeah, and just chill for the holidays and, and uh, maybe do some snowboarding and just kind of be home. Um, and I'm going to start start cranking out the next book and really exploring, um, you know, those stories and those ideas and and, uh, and hopefully have something have something in the works in the new year. Um, yeah, it's going to be great. And, uh, and you guys have some, I'm looking at your t-shirt right now. There's a big old yeah. picture of Fred on there. It looks awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool, man. Yeah. We have a bunch of, we're really excited about, um, uh, our new store, our new online store on Fred, We have new shirts, uh, in, in ladies and, and men's sizes and kids sizes. Some of them are Fred. Some of them are, are my hairy face next to Fred. And, and uh, they have a, a little, Fred is on, on Instagram. I think, one of the things he's best known for is his Fred, we call them Fredisms, his little Fred deep thoughts. Right. And so we have one of those on the back and just about stubborn positivity. And, um, and, uh, if you want to see it here, you can, oh yeah, there's a wagging tail, his wagging tail on the back. That's awesome. Yeah, it's cool. And we're working on collars and leashes actually too. We're designing those right now. And it's, it's great. Cause I think a lot of people, they want something that, you know, to kind of remind them of Fred every day that he's kind of become, this figure of, of, of resilience and, and, and the power of, of stubborn positivity, just kind of committing, you know, your, your interactions and your, your life to, to that idea. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're, we're psyched about our new online store and we're raising money every month. We're going to do a different nonprofit, a different veterans or a different animal rescue charity that, you know, a big portion of the proceeds will go or the profits will go, go to that. And, um, yeah. So that's, that's really exciting. That's awesome. We, with this uh, and a couple more questions here, just because I, I want to get this out. What, what do you mean when you say stubborn positivity? Because that's, that's something I hear constantly. Yeah. I see it on your Instagram. I see it. See, yeah. see Fred talking about that all the time. Right. Yeah. To me, it's and I, I love talking about this, especially at schools. Um, but every, I, I think a lot of people can, can adapt to it and kind of understand it. it, it it's this idea and it all kind of started when I start when I started sharing the story and I started to think about the the story of Fred and those first moments, those first moments that I walked up to him. And he, when I got close to him, I almost I almost turned around on this, you know, because I got I got about five or six feet from him and I was like, whoa, like he's covered in bugs, you know, and he's and he's his furs is all matted and dirty, you know, and, and I was like, Oh, you can't just this dog is he clearly never been taken care of before. He's clearly never interacted with a person, you know, positively before. Like you can't just walk up on this guy. 
Uh, but I heard just this little kind of thump, thump, thump coming from him. And I, and I, I looked up and he was, he was wagging his tail. And for him to do that when he clearly had no reason to, um, you know, it was a message. It was a message to, to me in that moment. The message was, Hey, like, I'm cool. Like, come check me out. Like, what do you got? You know, and, and it, it, it invited, and it was, it, it was a vulnerable thing. It was a, you know, it was a, uh, on his part, you know, it was more vulnerable and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about in terms of just opening yourself up, you know, and leading with your heart. Uh, that's, that's a scary thing to do. And especially for a dog that has no reason to, it wasn't what, you know, you would have expected. And so I, I came a little closer and, you know, our, our bond was, was began, you know, and it's made all that, that little wag of his tail has made all the difference in his life. And look at him now, he's chilling in New York, you know, and we, we have this awesome life, you know, and he, he never misses a meal and, you know, and we're having a lot of fun all the time. And it's, it's when I came home, I think that message meant even more to me because when I came home and, and I, and I was working a frustrating job and I felt like I, my energy wasn't going anywhere. And I was, I was drinking, I was putting it in the wrong places. I was drinking too much and, and I had some toxic relationships. And it, it, every time I thought like I was totally justified in being angry and being negative, I would think about Fred and I would think about those first moments when he had every reason to be negative and to be and to show his teeth and growl and try to get me to leave him alone. And so I guess what the message is, is in those moments, it's that when we feel like we have every reason to be angry and negative, it's the, those are the most important moments that we have, you know, opportunities to, to wag our tail. And, and that's where the stubborn kind of part comes into it. Cause it does take, it does take that same kind of, you know, idea of being stubborn which usually isn't a good thing but if you can apply that same energy that we put into being stubborn about things into being stubbornly positive and to really committing yourself to being positive and to, to finding things to be grateful for even if it's just the fact that you woke up that morning or that you you know you, you have a job or you have you know anything around you, you have a hot cup of coffee like you can if you start your day with gratitude and with positivity then everything kind of falls into place. And, and, and that's, so that's kind of the, the philosophy that, you know, that I really love sharing, you know, this idea of stubborn positivity. Um, and I think that's what people, people really kind of want a reminder of that, you know, and that's, that's what our shirts and, 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 all, and all of our Fred gear and our social media, like that's what we love doing. We love giving people, you know, an, an example of, of how far, you know, stubborn positivity can, can take you. You know, and that's, if, if nothing else, that's what we love traveling, you know, for like, here's this dog who started his life in this really harsh place, in this really unpredictable and volatile environment. And his life expectancy was, was in the single digits, you know, in terms of days probably. And now he's, you know, he's trotting across the country, you know, just seeing all this amazing stuff and going to all these fun places. So if nothing else, he's an example to all of us of, of, you know, what we're really capable of when we, open ourselves up, you know, mentally and, and we believe with our hearts and, and we choose to, to wag our tails uh, at the world. That's amazing. That's amazing. Where can people find all, all, all the, the, the Fred merch that you've got going on? Yeah. It's on fredtheafghan.com. That's our website. Yeah. It's in, there's, just, there's a little shop link down there. And, and uh, the, then the, the book is, uh, is on out in paperback now too. So it's a more foldable, foldable kind of crushable copy of it. You can, jam in your bag or wherever wherever you're going and, and uh that's everywhere the book is everywhere you can get books awesome awesome yeah. and and uh I'm, you got to check out their instagram as well one of the coolest instagrams out there i think that's fred the afghan as well um you get to see fred come behind fred as he's going on stage as he's yeah. going into uh into a high school gymnasium filled with kids waiting for him all kinds of different things yeah it's cool man yeah we have a lot of fun out there and I, I, I think one, one point I was, I, I was chewing on this morning was I, I love just what, what General Mattis said recently. I, I don't know if you saw the article. I can't, I can't remember where he was talking, but he, he was talking about the civilian military divide. Mm -hmm. And he kind of almost said something about stubborn positivity in my mind. Like that's kind of what he was getting at was stop being a jerk. Like stop 
if we if we as veterans stop acting like everyone owes us something or like we're better than the rest of the the population, then we can truly kind of bring our experiences and and get the most out of them. You know, and I and I, I'm I'm paraphrasing and taking away my own interpretation of what he was really talking about. But I love I love I, that guy. That guy's a, just a walking motivation machine. But that particular speech was, was, I think, what a lot of us really need to hear. You know, I, I think in this thank you for your service kind of culture, we get kind of elevated almost a little too much. You know, we feel like, you know, everybody should clap for us everywhere we go. and We should get, you know, half off, you know, mattresses or whatever, you know. And, and, and I think, you know, if we remind ourselves that we didn't, we didn't join for that stuff. We didn't join for that. You know, we joined to, to serve and not be served. And, and that we need to find our, our, our own way to serve, you know, once we take the uniform off, you know, I think that's, you know, again, kind of paraphrasing and taking my own interpretation of his words, but I, I really loved, I really love that he said that. I think that, you know, that's, that's a, a true, a true message that we all need to hear. Absolutely. Amazing. Craig, you know, number one, I want to wish you uh, safe travels and, and a Merry Christmas and happy holidays. Uh, you know, I think that this is your story is just so amazing. And I just want to acknowledge you for 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 putting it out there and raising positivity around everywhere you go. Uh, and Fred, too, over there, he, he's just chilling over there, sleeping a little bit. Um, but uh, but seriously, guys, if you're out there listening to this, definitely check out the book, Craig and Fred, if you haven't already definitely learn more about this story, spread it around. I think that this would make a perfect holiday gift for somebody that, that book, the, the Craig, uh, the, the Craig and Fred, uh, gear, all that stuff would be absolutely amazing. So with that guys, um, Craig, thank you so much for coming on and, and everybody out there. Thank you for listening. Have a happy holiday and get out there and live your best lives while you can. Thanks Chris.